Hi class, uh, in this lecture what I want to do is I want to do an introduction to basic concepts of statistics. Now we're going to be spending the next couple lectures, um, the next six lectures actually talking about um, different areas of statistics. And in this section what I want to talk about is sampling, something called frequency distributions, and then finally I want to talk about graphs. Okay, so we have four objectives in this lecture. So I want to describe the populations whose properties are being analyzed. So I'll define exactly what I mean by a population. I want to talk about uh, selecting an appropriate sampling technique. I want to talk about methods of organizing and presenting data. And then the last thing I'll talk about is I'll talk about um, identified deceptions and visual displays of data. So kind of talking about um, some statistics or, or presentations of data that is misleading in some way. Okay, so. First of all, what is statistics or what is the definition for it? So statistics is the method of collecting, organizing, analyzing, and interpreting data, as well as drawing conclusions based on that data. So basically what we're gonna be working with a lot in this section is different types of data sets. So we're gonna take the data set, which is just gonna be raw numbers, and we're gonna break them down into consumable information. And then from there, we're gonna talk about how you draw conclusions from that, or what, like what the data is telling us. So methodology of statistics is divided into two areas. First is what we call descriptive statistics. Basically what it is is just describing a data set. So collecting, organizing, summarizing, and presenting data. Okay, that's descriptive statistics. And then a more advanced um, type of statistics, which we won't talk too much about in this class, but I encourage you to take a more uh, another math course, a statistics course, where you'll learn more about this inferential statistics. And inferential statistics is making generalizations about and drawing conclusions from the data collected. So kind of like, what is, what is the data telling us? Okay, that's what inferential statistics is about. What can we conclude from it? Okay, so in statistics, you have two types of data. You can have a population data set or a sample data set. So a population is a set containing all the people or objects whose properties are to be described and analyzed by the data collector. So think of the population as all the possible data values, complete information, whereas a sample is a subset or subgroup of the population. So like you might have the population of all people in the United States, and a sample might just be a small subset of people like in a specific state, okay? But in statistics, actually what we're looking for is something called the representative sample. So this is a sample that exhibits characteristic typical of those possessed by the target population. So for example, if you have the population about the, of all the people in the United States, and suppose you wanna take a poll of the president's approval rate, okay? And you wanna figure out what all the people in the United States think about it. Well, you can't call all the population, so you take a sample. So if you wanted to get the president's approval rating, you wouldn't just call people in like New York or in Florida right? Because that's not really indicative of what the country thinks as a whole. So you need to find what's called a representative sample. So maybe you'd sample randomly from people in all 50 states, something like that. Okay, that's the difference. All right, so let's do a couple examples. Uh, so a group of hotel owners in a large city decide to conduct a survey among citizens of the city to discover their opinions about casino gambling. Okay, so a group of hotel owners in a large city. So I want to describe the population. Well, the population here is the set of all citizens in the city. Okay, that's who they're investigating because they want to get the discover what the citizens of the, the city think about gambling. So the population is all the citizens of the city. All right. Um, continuing off this, one of the hotel owners suggests obtaining a sample by surveying all the people at six of the largest nightclubs in the city on a Saturday night. Okay, that's what he wants to get as his sample for what people's opinions are. Each person will be asked to express his or her opinion on casino gambling. Does this seem like a good idea? Uh, well, actually, no, it doesn't. It. So questioning people at six of the city's nightclubs is actually a terrible idea. The nightclub subset is, is probably more likely to have a positive attitude towards casino gambling than the population of the uh, city's citizens. So this example here is not a representative sample. So... In statistics, um, if you want a representative sample, uh, one thing that's important is obtaining what's called a random sample. 
So a random sample is a sample obtained in such a way that every element in the population has an equally likely chances of being selected for the sample. So think about the random sampling as like um, putting everybody's name in a hat and drawing their names from the hat. So the methodology for this is you identify each element or each person in the population. You assign numbers to each element or each person in the population. You randomly select numbers and then assign the elements in the population to have those numbers, just put them into your sample set. Or, like I said, drawing names from a hat, if that helps. Okay, so go, continuing on, which of the following is the best way to select a random sample to find out how the city's citizens feel about casino gambling? Okay, so first is randomly survey people who live in the oceanfront condominiums of the city. Uh, so many hotels lie along the oceanfront, and these uh, people might object to the increased traffic and noise, which may result. It also does not give um, each citizen an equal chance because we're only talking about people who live in the oceanfront. So, like, that's probably not good. All right, so continuing on, um, how about this one? Survey the first 200 people whose name appear in the city's telephone book. Absolutely not. This does not give each citizen in the city an equal chance. About randomly select neighborhoods of the city and then randomly survey people within the selected neighborhood. Well, actually, yes, yes. This gives each citizen in the city an equal chance of being selected. So yeah, yeah, this works. All right, the next thing we wanna talk about is constructing what's called a uh, frequency distribution. So what a frequency distribution does is it um, takes raw data and puts it into a nice consumable table, all right? And so what frequency distributions are, frequency is really just like a count, right? So it's a count of some type. So suppose I have this data of the age of maximum yearly growth of 35 boys, okay? So I have the age of maximum growth. So this was um, their age, and this was like, think about this 10-year-old, what happened is, is However old he is, the, he had the most growth in his year 10 age, all right? Whereas people who were 14 years old, nine of those people in this data set had their max growth at this age. <clears throat> all right, anyway, so what I want to do is I want to take this, these 35 data values and put them into a nice consumable table, all right? So the way a frequency distribution works is, this is one way, is you take all the data values and you list them in order and then you count how many times that data value occurs. Like for example, the number 10 only occurred once. The number 11 here and here occurred twice. The number 12, if you go through it, would have occurred one, two, three, four, five times, and so on. And you'll notice if you do this, the, the values, the sum of this column here, the number of boys, the frequency, that totals to 35, or the total number of boys that we had in our sample. Okay, so this just took our raw data and put it into a nice consumable table. All right, so look at the numbers. It looks like as you go from 10, 11, 12, 13, up to 14, it's going up. And then after the age 14, you go down 15, 16, 17, 18, the data values, you know, the numbers, the counts go down. All right, so what are some conclusions we can draw from this? So it looks like maximum growth for most subjects occurred between the ages of 12 and 15. That's where the mass majority of people had their largest growth spurts. And then the number of boys who attained their maximum yearly growth at any given age increases until 14, as we saw, and then decreases after that. All right, so another way you could do this is uh, here, are, here are some statistics. This is when you have grouped frequency data or group frequency distribution. So here are the statistics test scores for a class of 40 students. Okay, so I've got 40 raw numbers. All right. Um, when you have something like this, where the numbers don't repeat too often, what you don't want to do, especially when you go back, like here, the numbers went right in a row. Here, these numbers don't do this. What we want to do is we want to group the frequencies into classings that, that are meaningful for the data. Okay. So basically, what I want to do is, since letter grades are, are given based on like 10 point ranges, what I want to do is I want to set up my classes. All right, here, like the groups, think of classes as the groups that you're gonna put the data into. So I'm gonna put the classes into 10 point ranges. 
So one grouping of values are going to be the numbers 40 to 49. This is actually 10, 10 values because there's 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49. It's 10 values. Then the next 10 values are 50 to 59, 60 to 69, 70 to 79, 80 to 89, and 90 to 99. And now what I want to do is I want to count the number of observations that fit into each class. So going back, there were three values that, of students who scored in the 40s. There were six values of students who scored in the 50s, and so on. And notice if you look back at this raw data, there's 40 of them. Our counts and our frequency totals up to 40. All right, so the class 40 to 49 has 40 as the lower limit and 49 as the upper limit. So this class width is 10, as I said. It is sometimes helpful to vary the width of the first or last class to allow for items to fall above or below most data, in case you need to do that. So next, um, I want to talk about some visual representation of this. So we have what's called a histogram. So a histogram is a bar graph with bars that touch, can be used to visually display data. So if you look here, here are the boys, um, Mac, the um, age of their maximum yearly growth and their counts. So, you know, when they had one per one boy who had the maximum growth at age 10, there were nine at age 14, and you can see the distribution of that data. So what a frequency polygon does is this is a line graph formed by connecting dots in the midpoint of each bar of the histogram. So all this does is put a line in the midpoint of each of these bars to show the data. These histograms are very common in the real world, and you've actually probably have seen them before. All right, let's talk next about another way to summarize data in what's called the stem and leaf plot. So this plot is constructed by separating each data item into two parts. Okay? So you're going to have your raw data. So the stem consists of the tens digits, and the leaf consists of the units digit for the data. So let me show you an example of what I mean. So I have this data here of the um, student test scores, okay? And I want to construct that stem and leaf plot from it. Well, what happens is, is you take the number four, okay? And you have its leaves. So like the number four, if you look back, the person on the 47, its stem is a four, its leaf is a seven. If you look at the number, say 57, it has a stem of five and a leaf of seven. Now, when you get to numbers like 64 and 63, look here, 64 and 63, they each have the same stem, 60. So you put the six here, and then you put the next leaf, the, the ones digit, the four and the three here. So it's just another way, if you continue doing this with all the remaining rows, this is what it will, this is what it'll look like. Like going back here, the number 82. The stem was an eight, it had a leaf of two. Then you go back, here's another eight and a two. So I already have the stem of eight, but I will put another two. If you look here, this is what the stem and leaf plot looks like. Now, if you notice this right here, looks an awful lot like this, just kind of um, tilted on its side. It's another way of, of representing the data. All right, let's talk about deceptions in uh, visual displays of data. So graphs can be used to distort the underlying data that you have. Um, so the graphs on the left and on the right here, what they show is they show the year and the poverty rate in the country. Okay, so the graph on the left stretches the scale on the vertical axis. So like, look, it starts at 11.3 and goes to 12.9, all right, to create the impression of a rapidly increasing poverty rate. Now the graph on the right, what it does is it compresses it, okay, so it goes from 11 to 19 here on the scale on the vertical axis to create the impression of a slowly growing poverty rate. The reality is that it's probably somewhere in between. All right, so things to watch for um, in visual displays of data. Is there a title that's explained uh, what is being displayed? Number two, are numbers lined up with tick marks on the vertical axis to nearly clearly indicate the scale. Has the scale been created? Uh, has the scale been varied to create a more or less dramatic impression than shown by the actual data? Do too many design and cosmetic effects draw attention away from or distort the data? 
Has the wrong impression been created about how the data are changing because equally spaced time intervals are not used on the horizontal axis? Furthermore, has the time interval been chosen that allows the data to be interpreted in various ways? Watch out for that. Um, are bar size scaled proportionately in terms of the data they represent? And uh, is there a source that indicates where the data came from? Right, that's important. Just take a oh, let's take one last look at this one here. Okay, uh, an example again about visual misle misleading visual displays. All right, so you have the number of square feet in an average U.S. single home. So, like in 1980, it was 1740, in 1990, it was 2000, 2080, and then by 2010. You were saying that the average um, square foot home was 2392. All right, so cosmetic effects of home with equal height, all right, but different uh, frontal additions and shadow lengths make it impossible to tell if they are proportionately depict the given areas. Time intervals on the horizontal axis are not uniform. Like, for example, it goes from 10 years here and then to 20, right? So that, that's a big one. Um, making it appear that dwellings similar have been linear from 1980 to 2010, which is not true. And the, the data just indicates that this is not, right? So there was a greater increase in area from 1980 to 1990. Okay, if you did an average there, it would average 34 square feet per year, then from 1990 to 2010, um, averaging approximately 15.6 square feet a year. Also, if you look at this shadow and this shadow, like this size, to go from this square feet to this square feet is less than double, but the shadow is more than double of this one, so just not appropriate scaling. All right, I have uh, actually posted a second lecture that does the um, histogram and frequency distributions in a little bit more detail, so I encourage you to watch that one as well.